Welcome back students. This is going to be chapter 6 on neurons. The chapter is divided nicely into four sections. Section A deals with the anatomy of the nervous system. Section B talks about membrane potentials and how they are regulated. Section C goes into detail about synapses and neurotransmitters. And the last section, section D, talks about the structure of the nervous system pertaining to the brain, the spinal cord, and the, the components of the peripheral nervous system. Some material is too deep for this course, and those slides are highlighted in grey, but we'll still talk about the information in case you need to know outside of this course. The human nervous system is divided into two major divisions. The central nervous system, which consists of the brain and the spinal cord, the CNS, and the peripheral nervous system, the PNS, which consists of everything else outside those two regions. The functional unit of the nervous system is the neuron. Neurons come in many shapes and sizes. The depiction in figure 6.1 is just a representation so we can learn the parts. The cell body and the processes from it that extend are very important. Normally anything carrying information towards a cell body is called a dendrite and information carried away from the cell body would be an exon. Exons do have branches and they do have terminals. The cell body is where the nucleus is found and the majority of the organelles. Neurons being very thin cells need a lot of caretakers and those caretakers are additional cells which are found strategically placed in the vicinity. One class of such supporting cells in the peripheral nervous system are called swan cells after the scientists who discovered them. Schwann cells form myelin, myelin sheets which surround the axons of the neurons, providing protection, nutrition, and also assisting in the conduction of nerve impulses. One outcome of the myelin sheath is that it speeds up the rate at which conduction of electrical impulses takes place along the axon, therefore conserving energy. Figure 6.2 shows in panel A a neuron with four or five myelin sheaths in purple. The myelin sheaths actually belong to Schwann cells, uh, you can see a nucleus of one of them right here. In the central nervous system, the same job is done by a different class of cells called oligodendrocytes. Let's remove the typo right there. This is the correct spelling now. The oligodendrocytes are actually highly branched cells, which are architecturally different to the swan cells. Regardless, they perform a similar function in providing support and insulation. A cross-section reveals that the axon is very intimately associated with the fatty layers, the membranes, of the swan cells or the oligodendrocytes. Returning our attention back to the neuron itself, we have to now discuss how material that's generated by the organelles in the cell body is delivered, sometimes huge distances away, to the ends of the cell exons where it's needed. So this could be neurotransmitter and it could be waste products. The cytoskeleton is key in carrying information. The microtubules form roadways along which proteins, motor proteins, carrying cargo travel. Please note that kinesin proteins carry cargo away from the cell body and dianin proteins carry cargo towards the cell body. There are three classes of neurons throughout the nervous system and they are used to make this abbreviation. A stands for afferent neurons carrying information towards the central nervous system. The I stands for interneurons and the E stands for efferent neurons that carry information away from the central nervous system. If one studies this diagram in a bit more detail you will notice that the cell bodies of the afferent neurons are very close to the central nervous system, whereas the cell bodies of the efferent neurons are within the central nervous system. Of course, the interneurons, their cell bodies, are part of the central nervous system. One will also note that the cell body is on a branch to one side of the main axon. This is an alternative arrangement for these neurons. In talking physiology, one must be able to use the right terminology at the right time. In physiology, a nerve is a bundle of connective tissue carrying many, many nerve fibers. So the true statement is to call each individual cell a nerve fiber. Here we can see blood vessels 
embedded amongst bundles of axons and connective tissue holding the whole structure together. This is a cross section of a nerve. Table 6.1 reiterates what we mentioned earlier about the similarities and differences and the architecture of the afferent, the efferent, and the interneurons. Please study this. When one neuron makes contact with another neuron, we call that a synapse. Synapses can be of two types. They can be electrical and chemical. We'll look at this in a second. Synapses may also inhibit the neighboring cell or they may excite the neighboring cell. And that, as we'll learn later, depends on the signal and the neurotransmitter used to communicate across the synapse. The important thing is, wherever we have a synapse, for instance right here, there's a cell before the synapse, there's a cell after the synapse. The cell prior to the synapse is called the presynaptic cell. The cell post-synapse is called the post-synaptic cell. Wherever you have a synapse, the cell prior and the cell post will have the same two labels. We mentioned earlier the oligodendrocytes. The oligodendrocytes are just one type of cell of many that support the neurons. The general name for these other cells altogether is called glial cells. So when somebody says glial cells, they're talking about the non-conducting cells of the nervous system. Glial cells of the central nervous system fall into four major classes. We already mentioned the oligodendrocytes. They form the insulation. We also have astrocytes. They regulate the composition of the extracellular fluid. Very important for maintaining the ion concentration so that action potentials, i.e. Uh, nerve impulses, can travel appropriately and quickly through the neurons. The microglial cells are part of the immune system and their job is to fight any, fight any pathogens that may arrive in this vicinity. And lastly, the cells that most students do forget, the ependymal cells, which are lining the fluid-filled cavities within the brain and the spinal cord that regulate the production and flow of the cerebral spinal fluid, a very important fluid necessary for proper functioning of the central nervous system. The next batch of slides talk about the development of the nervous system as well as its potential for healing. In the developing embryo, the stem cells give rise to the neurons and the glia. Once mature neural cells are developed, they differentiate, migrate to their final destination, but now they have to make a connection to their target location. And they send out processes, cellular processes, that will eventually become the axons that carry information away from the cell body and the dendrites which carry information towards the cell body. A specialized structure forms at the tip of the axon and that's known as a growth cone. And the growth cone extends to its target guided by other cells, especially the glial cells that have already established themselves. But more importantly, the pathway is highlighted, illuminated one could say, by neurotropic factors, growth factors released by the destination itself forming a gradient that the growth cone then follows to its target. Unfortunately, the developing fetus and the early baby are susceptible to many environmental cues that may damage these developmental pathways, including alcohol and drugs, radiation, malnutrition, and viruses. And these changes are normally permanent. As the baby continues to develop into adulthood and old age, many regions of the nervous system are able to adjust their structure and function. And that is known as plasticity. And the degree of neural plasticity varies with age. We're not talking about gross changes. Those are set and stay put. We're talking about the making and breaking of synapses and connections in local vicinities. These are all part of the growth curve of neurons where learning and memory take place. Neurons may suffer two types of damage. One type of damage can heal itself, the other type cannot. If the neuron is cut, a clean cut, uh, the part still connected to the cell body has the potential to grow back and to its destination target, whereas the part severed from the cell body atrophies and, and withers away, a process known as degeneration. Return of function takes time, 
because these neuron axons only grow at a millimeter per day. And suppose you cut something in your leg and it has to reach the toe, that could take many months. Unfortunately, crush injuries where the neuron is not severed, the problem may not lie primarily with the axon itself of the nerve, but with the support cells. Those support cells will experience apoptosis as a result of their injury. And that normally results in the loss of the myelin sheath. And then the electrical transmittance of the axon is severely hampered to a point that it cannot effectively communicate its desires. Needless to say, with our discoveries in pathophysiology, we have now technologies that are trying to circumvent these broken neurons. One way is to create tubes across the damaged region redirecting the axons so that they do not experience apoptosis. Another avenue of investigation is the use of stem cells to redifferentiate them into neurons. The next section of the chapter deals with nerve impulses. This is a very chemistry orientated section. Before we look at the chemistry, we need to look at some physics. The physics has to do with charge. We know that like charges repel and unlike charges attract. The charges which we're going to be speaking of are to do with ions, positive ions and negative ions, cations and anions. Two other physical factors are also important. One is the concentration of the charge. As the quantity of the charge increases, the force also increases. Conversely, as the separation of the charge increases, i.e. the charge becomes more distantly located, then the force between them decreases. The next thing to remember is that the plasma membrane is a very good insulator of charge. So unless there's a passageway through the membrane, the charge is stuck on the side at which it resides. Using instruments such as voltmeters, where one electrode is placed inside the cell and the other electrode is placed outside the cell, one can measure the voltage difference across the membrane. And that can be recorded in a graph. In this particular graph, one can see the bottom axis, the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is the recorded membrane potential, measured in millivolts. Initially, the recording is zero because the probe has not penetrated into the cell yet. But as soon as penetration of the electrode takes place, the electrode is now inside the cell. It will now measure the difference in voltage between the two electrodes. And in this case, it's about minus 70 millivolts. A very important number. Neurons that are not firing action potentials or any other type of electrical activity are said to be resting. So the membrane potential that's measured at that time is called the resting membrane potential. The size of the resting membrane potential varies through neurons throughout the body and between different species of organisms, but the average range of a resting membrane potential is minus 40 to minus 90 millivolts. We have forgot to tell you that the reference point is the inside of the cell. So whatever we mention the membrane potential, that is in reference to the inside of the cell. Not the outside, but the inside of the cell. Please remember that. That potential can change normally by the movement of ions across the membrane. Scientists are able to calculate the membrane potential at different points using different systems, artificial systems as well as real systems. One of the most important contributions to understanding how neurons work was made by three scientists named Goldman, Hodgkin, and Katz. And they have in their honor a, an equation that measures the membrane potential once the concentrations of various ions are known. The GHK equation is an extension of the Nernst equation the Nernst equation is named after the scientist Nernst, who originally was able to calculate the effect on the membrane potential of a single ion at a time. There are not too many values students are asked to remember in this course, but for the first time we're going to ask you to remember these values in this chapter. The concentration of sodium is different outside the cell 
and inside the cell, as is the concentration of two other very important ions. So sodium concentration outside the cell is about 145 millimoles per liter, whereas it's only 15 millimoles per liter inside the cell. Likewise, the concentration of chloride ion is higher outside than inside the cell. However, the concentration of potassium is the reverse. It's very, very low outside and about 30 times higher on the inside of the cell, 150 millimoles per liter. The next very important commodity to understand is that we're dealing with charge very, 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 very close to the plasma membrane. In almost all cases, the electrical content further out is balanced, is neutral, as it is deep inside the cell. But very close to the membrane, because of what we're going to learn in the next few minutes, the action of ion channels, uh, that membrane is kept in a very polarized state. Closer examination of this figure confirms that the inside of the cell is negatively charged close to the membrane, whereas the outside is more positively charged. A good understanding of the natural habits of ions can be deduced from the next few slides. In this example, it's important to understand what the experiment is trying to do. We have two compartments. This compartment here in dark blue represents the extracellular fluid, and this represents the intracellular fluid, or the inside of the cell. And these little red dots that you see between the partition of the two chambers, they represent ion channels. In this case, just for potassium, potassium ion channels. If one places only sodium chloride outside in compartment one and places potassium chloride inside in compartment two, inside and outside refers to the extracellular and intracellular fluid, and then one does the following experiments, then one would notice something strange happening. If you open the potassium channel, potassium will move across into the first compartment. Sodium cannot move because it cannot pass through these channels because they're not for sodium, they're only for potassium. So that tells you the uniqueness of some of these channels is designed for only one type of ion. Let's get back to the experiment. As the potassium begins to move across, then the buildup of the charge in compartment one begins to push back on further potassium coming in. And then now potassium is pushed back out at a ever increasing rate until you reach an equilibrium. And at the equilibrium, which is a sum of both the concentration of chemistries and the electrical commodity, the ions. So that's a very important component to understand. These are electrochemical gradients, not electrical gradients or chemical gradients, but two of them put together. So as more and more potassium comes out into this chamber, the positive charge of both the potassium and the sodium builds up and it starts pushing back. Then the system settles down at a equilibrium based on the iron itself, the potassium in this case. As we can see in the very last panel, the membrane potential is negative on the inside and positive on the outside. This is what would really happen in a real cell. If we now repeat the experiment, but this time we change the structure so that we replace the red potassium channels with the blue channels for just sodium, sodium ion channels, once the experiment settles down to an equilibrium, we find that some of the sodium is now across in compartment number two, but the potassium is unable to cross across. In this case, the outside, i.e. the compartment one, has a negative charge, and compartment two, which represents the inside of a cell, would have a positive charge. So if only potassium was allowed to move, it would generate a negative membrane potential. If potassium was allowed to move, it would generate a positive membrane potential. That's what these ions do individually at the concentrations used. If we translate the two experiments, 
into a graph, it will start to make more sense. And this is where we can now start mimicking what really happens around a natural cell. So here's a membrane potential in millivolts. This is zero. This is plus 60. This is minus 70. This is minus 90. So if you set up the experiment such as this and you let it settle down, allowing only the potassium to move, the potassium will take the membrane potential from minus 70 down towards minus 90. So the movement of potassium wants to push the membrane potential further away from zero into the negative. That's what potassium does in a situation where the concentrations and the movements are restricted as we discussed earlier. Do the same experiment with sodium and you'll find that the membrane potential wishes to be moved to the positive at about plus 60. This is great because if you open the appropriate channel, you can move the minus 70 in either direction between minus 90 and plus 60. And that's what nature does. It opens the potassium channels if it wants to move things towards minus 90, and it opens sodium channels if it wants to move things towards plus 60 with respect to the membrane potential. So what is it about a living cell that allows it to establish gradients where sodium is high on the outside and potassium is high on the inside? And the answer is something you may be familiar with. The most important pump that our cells have, that's what does this. The sodium-potassium ATPase pump is responsible for moving and keeping sodium high outside the cell and potassium high inside the cell. And the way it does this is also fantastic. The design of these pumps moves three sodiums out with their positive charges, but only allows two potassiums in with their positive charges. So for every turn of the pump, three pluses are moved out, but only two pluses are moved in. So naturally, over time, the inside of the cell close to the membrane will become negatively charged, whereas outside close to the membrane it will become positively charged simply because of the actions of tens of thousands of these pumps continuously working day and night. Naturally, they need energy, and the energy comes from ATP. So a significant proportion of the ATP made by cells is used just to drive these pumps. And that's why we need to keep eating on a regular basis in order to supply our body with energy. Hold on a second, hold on a second. This presents us with a problem. If a neuron never fires, then these pumps would continuously continue to make the outside more positive and the inside more negative. Therefore, the membrane potential won't be stable at minus 70. It'll continuously decrease, becoming, sorry, it will continuously increase, get larger, more negative. Actually, what I just said is not a slip of the tongue. It's a common mistake that students make. And I'll come back to that in a couple of slides. To prevent this unusual situation from materializing with the inside becoming more and more negative, nature has equipped membranes with ion channels that are considered to be leaky. Leaky ion channels for both potassium and sodium exist. The ones for potassium are more leaky than the ones for sodium, believe it or not. Regardless, over time, there's a nice equilibrium set up between the activity of the sodium-potassium ATPase moving sodium out and positive charge out and the leakiness of both the sodium and potassium ion channels. And this settles the membrane down at minus 70 millivolts on a resting neuron. Thus, one needs a compound view in order to understand membrane potential. And that's what figure 613 attempts to do. We can see here the sodium-potassium ATPase moving three sodiums out for two sodiums in. And then we have the leaky ion channels for both sodium and potassium. And the potassium ones are present in greater numbers to indicate that they are more leaky than the sodium. Are you ready to put it back together now?
So let's do that. Let's go back to this figure. If the ATPase settles the membrane at minus, say, minus 30, and there's more potassium leaving the cell through the leaky channels than there is sodium, which way do you think the membrane potential will move? Would it move down towards minus 90 or move up towards plus 60? Think about it. The answer is it will move down towards minus 90. And it'll come down and settle down at minus 70, which is a perfect balance between the entire system. That's how we get a minus 70 membrane potential around a living cell. Let's get back to the misunderstanding. The misunderstanding occurs when students try to add labels to indicate which direction the membrane potential is migrating. Here's a figure. And in this figure, we're going to be using all these words, and they come from here. So we're going to be using the depolarization label, the repolarization label, and something called the hyperpolarization label. Before we go and look at the bottom of this slide, let's look at the figure. Imagine that the resting membrane potential is minus 70. Zero is here. So a membrane is polarized when it's anything other than zero. So it would be negatively polarized if it's down, and it would be positively polarized if it's up. And the further you get away from zero in either direction, the more polarizing you're becoming. So if you start life at minus 70 and you get further away from the zero, then you're becoming hyperpolarized, very polarized. I think everybody would agree that minus 90 is bigger number than minus 70 in terms of distance from zero. Likewise, as you move towards zero in the membrane potential, you're becoming depolarized eventually becoming non-polarized at zero. And if you continue to move in the other direction, you could use the word repolarizing, but that would confuse people. So we just say you overshoot the zero into the plus territory. And then when you bring the membrane back towards the dotted line from anywhere above, you're set to be repolarizing. This is very important. Spend a few minutes understanding this. Here's a small mini glossary that they put together for us because students do tend to get confused. The easy part of this is here when we're looking at potentials. So these names, these prefixes, are just simply describing certain types of cells that are specialized uh, to conduct electricity. So pacemaker potential refers to the specialized cells that are able to generate graded potentials in certain types of cells, as in the heart. Receptor potential is given to sensory receptor cells. And then synaptic potential refers to the cells in this chapter and, and their graded potentials. Action potentials are the all or nothing depolarization of a neuron, which we're gonna learn about next. Graded potentials take place in the non-axon part of the neurons or in sensory cells. We just learned about the resting membrane potential. We just had a quick lesson in equilibrium potentials. Membrane potential is simply the electrochemical gradient that's measured across the membrane. And the potential or potential difference is a physics term indicating to us that there, there is energy stored across the two sides of that membrane. And that energy can be used to drive things such as electrical impulses. Let's start by looking at graded potentials before we look at action potentials. What is a graded potential? A graded potential is best learned by considering an analogy. The analogy that I like to use is that of a pebble being tossed into a pond. And we're looking at the water. So when the pebble hits the water, ripples are generated in all directions. And the ripples, as they move out, they die off. So eventually, 
the ripples die away. And that's what a graded potential is. A graded potential is a disturbance in the electrical membrane potential on the inside of a plasma membrane caused by the entry of ions. So there's an influx of ions, sodium normally, and that causes the inside to become positively charged at the point of the ion channel. And from the ion channel, the analogy applies. So as the sodium rushes in, it acts like a pebble, and it causes ripples of positive charge to emanate in all directions around that ion channel. The further away the ripple gets, the more distance it has to cover, because the ripples are growing in size, just like a real ripple, and therefore the height of the waves dies down. The energy is dissipated over a greater area. And the same thing happens to the waves of positive charge that enter a cell from the outside. They too also die down. Now let's stop a second and look at the size of my pebble. If I throw a large pebble into the pond, I will generate, on average, larger ripples. And if I throw a small pebble, the corresponding ripples will be smaller. And now apply that to this analogy. If you open the sodium ion channel for a short period of time, that's akin to throwing in a small pebble. So you get a small disturbance of the charge on the inside of the cell. Whereas if you open the sodium ion channel longer, or indeed open lots of them in that vicinity, that's akin to throwing a large pebble into the water, resulting in a greater disturbance that can travel further from the original location. Therefore, depending on how much positive charge enters the cell, the magnitude, the height of the positive membrane potential can vary. And that's what we call by graded potential. Graded means it can be a percentage from 0 to 100, depending on the other parameters. Figure 615 attempts to relay this in a graphical sense. So we can see a positive charge is entering the cell, and that's causing a ripple-like effect, and the charge is then moving along the inside surface of the membrane and a short distance into the cell, causing the area to become less negative, i.e. depolarized. But the further out you go, then the waves will die off, and then eventually they'll be absorbed into the neighborhood, and therefore this signal will no longer be able to travel any further. Let's look at some experimental data. The bottom axis is time in milliseconds, so this is pretty fast. And then the y-axis for all three parts of this chart are membrane potential in millivolts. So let's see. Minus 70 millivolts, that sounds familiar. That may be the resting membrane potential of this experimental cell. So here's the stimulus that applies to these ion channels. And then as the ion channels open, they cause a depolarization, i.e. moving towards zero, of the membrane potential. But very quickly, as time passes, the ripple dies away, and the membrane potential recovers through the action of sodium-potassium ATPases, and it restores itself. Subsequently, you apply a different stimulus that opens a potassium ion channel, or something that lets in negative charge into the cell. And therefore, the additional negative charge will cause the membrane potential to become hyperpolarized until the system recovers again. In the middle panel, we're looking at different types of stimulus. So the same stimulus that was applied here is applied here, and we get the same profile. And then we apply a stronger stimulus. This could result in more sodium channels being opened at once. And therefore, the influx of sodium causes a larger blip than a lesser amount of sodium entering the cell. The last panel simply indicates a simultaneous measurement of a stimulus 
and this is measured at the point of the iron channel and this is measured one millimeter away in any direction. So you can see this indicates that as the ripple migrates one millimeter away it begins to die down. What causes the signal to dissipate? In this case it's the presence of these leaky potassium ion channels that suck some of the charge to the extracellular fluid, therefore minimizing the distance that the electrical activity can spread. Let's look now at action potentials. Action potentials are fascinating in themselves. Normally what happens when an action potential disturbs a resting membrane potential, we end up going towards about plus 30 and that change is going to be 70 plus 30, about 100 millivolt difference between when the cell's resting and when it's activated itself and generates a action potential. So action potentials have a delta of about 100 millivolts. The second thing to realize is that these action potentials are very rapid and they don't last very long, about one to four milliseconds. Once one has died down, once one wave has died down, you have the potential to start a second wave. Therefore, the frequency of these, one wave following the other, can be several hundred per second, which is quite fast. Cells that generate action potentials using the energy stored in their membrane potential difference are known to be excitable. So excitability is the term that's used. And these cells, of which only a few exist around the body in terms of types, are normally neurons, muscle cells, and some specialized cells that we'll look at in the future. The propagation of the action potential down an exon is independent of it, the distance of the exon. So once you initiate an action potential, it will continue all the way down from the back of your spine down to your toe without losing any momentum. Thus action potentials are used to communicate long distances down neurons and even short distances such as the spinal cord and the brain. The propagation of action potentials along an axon requires the utilization of several types of ion channels. Before we discuss them let's put in perspective the role of graded potentials. For a neuron to generate an action potential down its axon it first has to receive input telling it to do so and that input comes in by way of graded potentials feeding into a specific location within the exon called the hillock. We'll talk about the hillock in a few moments. So the graded potentials rely on ligand gated ion channels or mechanically gated ion channels that pull and push on the dendrites or the cell body either in individual or normally in multiples. So you could have hundreds of these or even hundreds of thousands of these simultaneous graded potentials being generated on the surface of a single neuron. The sum of all these activities will decide whether an action potential is generated or not. In contrast, action potentials rely on voltage gated ion channels exclusively as well as leaky channels and the ATPase pump. But when it comes to the movement of ions, uh, one ion channel will affect another ion channel in the voltage gated pattern. You'll see that in a few seconds. Physiologists have identified dozens of different types of voltage gated ion channels and they vary by which ion they conduct. And the most common ones that we'll use in this chapter are sodium, potassium, and a few others that we'll mention later are calcium and chloride. Each one has a specific effect on the membrane potential. Evolution has had a major impact on the design of these ion channels. Without going into too much detail, it's important for students to realize that the sodium ion channel has three states that it bounces through when it's activated. So normally it's closed until an action potential comes along and that action potential 
will initiate an opening of this channel. Because this channel is voltage gated, it will be responding to a change in voltage in its vicinity. When that voltage comes along from somewhere, it will open, but only open for a period of time. And during that opening, sodium will rush into the cell at huge amounts, millions of ions maybe every second. But then automatically the ion channel will assume an inactivated state and become unresponsive to any further disturbance in its environmental membrane potential. But this will last another defined period of time and then it will go back to the closed configuration where it will be equally responsive to the next action potential. So this is a very important sequence of events that takes place with regard to the sodium ion channel only. The potassium ion channels are straightforward, either they're open or closed, and they too respond to voltage changes in their vicinity. And when they detect a voltage significant enough, they will open, allow potassium to rush out of the cell for a specified period of time, dependent on the voltage changes. And once the voltage hits a certain parameter, then the ion channel will close again. The combined result is an action potential. Place your probe anywhere along the axon, and that point will experience this profile as a wave of action potential passes by. So initially, both ion channels are closed. Then along comes an action potential of a certain value, and that will initiate the opening of first the sodium ion channel, which is responsible for moving the membrane potential towards the plus 30. That's what sodium likes to do, as we found out earlier. And then these ion channels become inactive, and the sodium ion channels open. And now sodium is responsible for dictating what happens. And as the sodium moves, it does what it naturally does. It pulls the membrane potential towards minus 90. That's where sodium likes to remain. But the sodium ion channel will eventually close too, and the membrane potential will recover due to the activity of the sodium potassium ATPase. And eventually it will go and settle down at minus 70 once more. So this is a profile at any particular point along the axon. The bottom graph simply shows you what's happening with regard to which iron. So you can see here, this is the potassium iron in red and the sodium iron in blue. And that's what happens to their relative membrane permeability. So permeability means their opening. A more logical look at any particular point on the membrane is indicated by this chart. So we have a stimulus that causes the opening of the voltage-gated sodium channels. They will then increase the permeability of sodium. Sodium will flow in, and that increased sodium will cause a local, localized uh, graded potential, say, or the localized movement of electricity of the positive type on the inside of the cell. And that will cause the depolarization of the membrane potential, therefore opening neighboring, opening neighboring sodium channels. And this cycle then accelerates as the action potential begins to migrate along the axon. So the opening of one opens another, which opens another, which opens another. I would say that's an example of something that we have discovered in the past is called positive feedback. So if somebody asks you to give you an example of positive feedback at the molecular level, the sodium channels in action potentials are the perfect answer. The situation is the reverse when you study the activity of just the potassium ion channel, the voltage-gated potassium ion channels. So the opening of the voltage-gated potassium ion channel increases the membrane permeability to potassium, 
the potassium flows out of the cell, the membrane repolarizes, and that has a negative effect in closing the sodium ion channel. Figure 621 is very important. Let's look at the bottom half first, and the two are related. The bottom axis is time, and the y-axis is the strength of the stimulation. How much do you stimulate this neuron? And this is the responding membrane potential in the exon, in the exon of the neuron. So, slight stimulus has a slight perturbance in the membrane graded potential. But there's no action potential because you have to hit this line, the threshold potential, before an action potential is generated. But this stimulus here is enough to trigger a action potential. And once you go over this line, then you get all or nothing. So either you're going to get an action potential or you're not. And this stimulus is enough to generate an action potential. If you increase the stimulus, then the action potential is generated, but it can't be made any bigger because it's all or nothing. Therefore, increasing the stimulus even more has no greater effect than to generate an action potential. This is an important concept about these neurons. This slide simply talks about the use of anesthetics and how they can prevent the passage of information along neurons to the brain so the brain is not aware of what's happening when the dentist is drilling into your tooth. So Novocaine and Xylocaine are chemicals that are used to block voltage-gated sodium channels. Poisons can also act in a similar fashion. So the puffer fish produces something known as tetrodotoxin, and this prevents the voltage-gated sodium channels from doing their job by binding to them. Let's talk about refractory periods. There's two types. There's something called the absolute refractory period and the relative refractory period. A figure will help us. Let's turn to this figure here. What we see is an action potential in blue. And as we found out earlier, the action potential will die down and return to the resting membrane potential about here and then it can be fired again. So this period from the time the action potential initiates to the time that it can be fired at the same all or nothing level is called the relative refractory period. Because during this point within this bracket you cannot fire another action potential of the same intensity. In fact, the relative refractory period actually begins here and not back here. Why? Because this segment here, this bracket, is called the absolute refractory period. That means when you initiate an action potential, you cannot, you cannot generate another action potential, doesn't matter what you do, until that much time has passed and the system has hit this point. The reason being that the sodium ion channels are inactivated. You have to wait till they become closed in order to try to activate them again. So what is this period here between this point and this point, the relative refractory period? What that means is in order to get an action potential, the stimulus has to be proportionately larger than the normal stimulus. If you wait a few milliseconds, then the stimulus can be less rigid than this one and to get an action potential, and the size of the action potential will start approaching the maximum or the all or nothing value. So you can get action potentials generated during the relative refractory period, but the closer you are to the original action potential, the less amplitude that action potential would have. The reason has to do with the movement of the ions and their not being put back into the appropriate position. For the next action potential. Under normal circumstances, action potentials move one way down an axon, from the cell body towards the axon 
ends the terminal. What's responsible for that is the refractory period. The fact that the sodium ion channels are in a inactivated state is very important to prevent the signal from traveling backwards as well. The excitation of muscle cells and their action potentials are designed to be initiated near the middle of the cells so that the signal can reach the ends of the cells at the same time. The speed at which the wave of action potential travels down an axon can be influenced by two things. The diameter of the axon, the larger the diameter, the quicker the action potential moves. And the second thing is something we mentioned earlier, the wrapping of the axon in myelination. So myelinated axons, as opposed to the same size axon that's not myelinated, will transmit signals much, much faster. The wave of positive charge entering the cell at the point of the action potential has an ability to travel internally, like a ripple, for some distance before it dies out. And that has been made use of by nature. So the myelination, the myelin in the myelination process acts as an insulator and it doesn't allow the presence of any kind of ion channel in its vicinity. So there are no sodium ion channels underneath myelin. But in order to satisfy the physics, the width of the myelin along the axon has to be proportional to how far a graded uh, wave of positive charge can travel. So we have things called the nodes of Renvier, which are located at strategic points along an axon. And that's indicated in this figure here. So here's a gap, there's a node of Renvier, and there's a myelin sheath. And the myelin sheath is just big enough to allow the positive charge that enters through these sodium ion channels to form a wave that will travel and initiate this sodium ion channel. Therefore, had this been wider, then that wave would have died before it got here, and these cells, uh, sorry, these uh, ion channels would never be able to be activated. So this is a solution based on physics and chemistry, and mathematics to some degree. So there's the relationship between nodes of Renvier and the degree of myelination. So basically what the electricity is doing, it enters here, then it jumps here, then it enters here, then it jumps here. And this jumping action has a name, it's called saltatory conduction. And that's mentioned right here, right? And in Latin, saltare means to leap. So the electricity is leaping. Why is that a desire of evolutionary processes? Well, the first thing it is, it's metabolically more efficient to have these nodes. Because all you have to do is maintain this area electrically and restore that after the action potential passes rather than the entire axon. And the second reason is the presence of this myelination um, allows the axon to be thinner. Thus, one can pack more nerve fibers into each nerve. Table 6.4 does a beautiful job of contrasting grading potentials with action potentials. Check your knowledge, please. Let's move forward and now talk about the synapse. When we study enough neural pathways, we come to some general conclusions. In some cases, multiple neurons, they converge on a single neuron, and that's called convergence. The opposite is also seen, where a single neuron with branched axons impinges and forms these uh, synapses with multiple neurons. And this is called divergence. Convergence and divergence. Very important concepts. The communication between two neurons, or between a neuron and something else, like a muscle, can take place through something called a synapse. And there's two types of synapses. There's a chemical synapse and an electrical synapse. 
Electrical synapses are easy to understand. This one indicated here in this figure 626A. So this neuron wants to pass information onto this cell. And it does so directly using gap junctions. Lots of gap junctions. Gap junctions are basically an extension of this cell into that cell in the um, uh, cytosol. So the wave of electricity can just hop through into this cell and excite the neighboring cell. Chemical synapses use chemicals known as neurotransmitters, and these are more complicated. With respect to a chemical synapse, the release of chemicals by the presynaptic cell is required. So this cell has not just to release the neurotransmitter, it needs to make it. Not only does it have to make it, it has to control how long it lasts for. So there's a lot of complicated stuff going on. In addition, it needs to move the chemistry back to the cell body for processing and manufacture, especially the proteins from the RNA. So that's done through the cytoskeleton that we looked at earlier. Luckily, mitochondria are positioned close to the needs of the cell's terminal. This is what happens when an action potential arrives at this buton or the terminal region of an axon. The positive charge of sodium traveling on the inside activates these voltage-gated calcium ion channels eventually. When that, when that wave of electricity arrives here and here, it will turn on these ion channels, which are voltage-gated. And they are ion channels for calcium. And calcium will enter the cytosol, and that entry of cytosol, sorry, the entry of calcium into the cytosol acts as a secondary messenger, causing a change in the cytoskeleton and the snares that are attached to these vesicles that contain the neurotransmitter. And these vesicles, some of them will be forced by exocytosis to release their contents into this cleft. And that's the neurotransmitter. And the neurotransmitter will then diffuse rapidly across the gap to the postsynaptic cell. And that will have receptors that are chemically gated sodium channels in most cases, right? So the neurotransmitter will bind to these, open the sodium channels, and sodium will rush in, therefore initiating another wave of action potentials. The snares are indicated in the bottom half of the figure. What we just mentioned is listed here. The neurotransmitter has to be removed, as we said earlier, and there's four main mechanisms that cells can use. The first is to actively transport it back into the presynaptic terminal of the cell that made it. That's called reuptake. The second one is to degrade it by nearby glial cells. It could diffuse away out of the cleft, or it may be enzymatically transformed into some other substance. Cells normally use a combination of these rather than one or another. If the chemical transmitted across the synapse, the cleft, excites the postsynaptic cell as an EPSP, excitatory postsynaptic potential. If, however, the chemical that's released has the opposite effect, then it's called an IPSP, inhibitory postsynaptic potential. We can see how these work now. In this case, the chemical causes the membrane potential to get closer and closer to the threshold. And once it reaches the threshold, that cell will then fire an action potential. This, on the other hand, pushes the membrane potential further away from the resting membrane potential, i.e. making it hyperpolarized, thus making it harder and harder to generate an action. Figure 628 gives a nice example of an EPSP. You can see the movement towards threshold of this particular graded potential. This is an inhibitory postsynaptic potential, and you can see it's moving away from threshold, therefore making it harder to fire. Figure 630 
sets the stage for looking at when the extracellular chloride concentration is equal to the resting membrane potential. What that means is if chloride moves into the cell, it's not going to change the membrane potential. So if this arrow indicates the opening of the chloride channels, then there will be no effect because, as we just mentioned, uh, there is no change in the potential. Whereas the green arrows would work the normal way, as we showed back here in the EPSP. When they are act Sorry, when these stimuli are applied, there is a, a depolarization of the membrane potential. What happens when you do both these stimuli, positive and negative, together? Then one cancels out the effect of the other. So the influx of positive charge is negated by the entry of chloride into the cell at the same time. And the chloride is negatively charged. Figure 631 is a very, very simplified view of a neuron with its synapses of various types. So we have two neurons that are synapsing with this one that are excitatory, and one is inhibitory. And that's what these arrows refer to down here, the A and the B, and then of course the C. But before we look at these profiles, it's important to realize that the hillock is the all-important area of a neuron. What happens at the hillock will determine if an action potential is generated or not. So each one of these points is trying to influence the hillock, the voltage at the hillock. And that's what this line represents the measurement of the membrane potential at the hillock and nowhere else. So let's now look at it. In panel 1, we fire A twice, but we wait until the first graded potential dies down before we activate the second. And therefore, there is no summation. Now, we fire A twice, then the first wave will reach the hillock, and before it dies down, a second wave will reach the hillock. So we have summation. It's called temporal summation because that's summation in time. We can also have spatial summation. If B fires by itself, then you just get a one graded potential. But if A and B fire together, that's what spatial summation means, then both are equal distance from the hillock, and both waves will arrive and cause a small tsunami. And that's what we see here. If you fire A twice and B twice in succession quite rapidly, then you can see the effects. There's summation going on to the point that you actually exceed the threshold with the firing of the second B, and that causes an action potential to then shoot down the axon. If you fire C at any time, it's going to cause the membrane potential to deviate away from the threshold. If A and C fired simultaneously, then they'll cancel each other out, and there will be no change in the membrane potential. Now imagine a neuron like this with 100,000 synapses. You can see the potential for that neuron to act like a mini-computer. Based on the descriptions already provided in the previous few slides, one should be able to deduce the relationship between the chart and the diagram. Remember, the important thing is this brown area where the decision is made to generate an action potential or not. Look what's happening to the electrical charge. The entry of negative ions is causing the negative charge to be pulled away from the hillock, making it harder for the hillock to be reaching threshold. The relationships between different types of synapses can be quite complex. Sometimes you find the terminal buton, or the terminal axon synapsing with 
another terminal exon such that this will immediately influence the behavior of this even though signals are coming down from its own exon. So this will attenuate the signal, therefore influencing the deployment of neurotransmitter. Pretty complex. That complexity is relayed by table 6.5, which tries to lay out all the factors in the presynaptic cell that could change the strength of the synapse, as well as those in the postsynaptic cell, as well as general factors. Drugs and toxins can interfere with the synapse. For instance, the toxin produced by the Clostridium tetani bacteria, tetanus, is a protein-destroying enzyme, a protease, that destroys the snare proteins, therefore preventing the vesicles carrying the neurotransmitter from fusing with the membrane at the synapse. This inhibits neurotransmitter release and ultimately this causes excess muscle contraction and a rigid or spastic paralysis. In contrast, botulism, the product of the Clostridium botulism bacteria, can also block neurotransmitter release by destroying snare proteins. In this case, the target excitatory synapses that activate skeletal muscles. Botox is a therapy based on botulism toxin, and that can be used for many cosmetic and therapeutic treatments. At any point in the signal transmittance between a presynaptic and postsynaptic cell could be targeted by drugs either to increase or decrease that activity. And we can see here a list of comprehensive actions that can take place at a synapse. Table 6.6 .6 lists some of the classes of chemicals known to be neurotransmitters or neuromodulators. We'll get into the nitty-gritty of all this in the next video. Thank you so much.